question, uh, which is a very contemporary question, uh, is to understand the relation between security surveillance and democracy. And we have been told many times that democracy can exist only if, when attacked, the political system can react in emergency and can take exceptional measures to assure their survival. So security protects democracy. We have been told also many times that this rhetoric is even more dangerous than the danger it seems to combat. And that security seen as exceptional measures beyond the realm of normal politics and rule of law paves the way for a destruction of democracy and its prevention into what has been called a permanent state of emergency, an everyday state of exception without end. So too often we have seen difficult political questions arising to this relation between violence, danger, political community and action, necessitating very careful political judgment transform into an accountancy of the positive and negative aspects of security and freedom. And a form of what I call a debilitating metaphor of balancing security versus liberty. As if in this balance you have two equal and necessary values that the government in charge has to calculate in order to find the right equilibrium. But as I will try to show, these two values are not so obviously independent. And it's very difficult in terms of social practice even to separate what is freedom and what is security. Could we make the difference? And after, even if we can, could we have the possibility to create a kind of balance? And of course, we will see, see that you have a lot of discussion about that, especially in law, where it's not the formula of balance, but the, the idea which is really different of necessity and proportionality, which is at stake. But in other domain, especially by the profession of politics, the terminology of balance is there and has been there for what we can call the long decade. I, uh, I take this formula from Martin Sheeny, who was a UN reporter on human rights. And I think it's a good idea because it means Yes, 2001 means something, but it's a very long decade because it became really important largely before 2001. So uh, I will try to come back to that. So what, what, what are the arguments? The, the main argument is to say that in a context of arising violence, interpreted in different narratives as radically new, and radically more dangerous than ever. The equilibrium is to raise security measures and to sacrifice some individual freedoms. To survive individuals, but also cities, nation, even the planet, depending on the scale of the narrative of the danger, have to be protected by security measures in order to enjoy their life. The duty to protect, the responsibility to protect, implies to act efficiently, not only after the violence or the catastrophe, but to act on time or even before in order to prevent a catastrophe to happen. And to do so, the person in charge of deciding have to gather a maximum of information to store them, to keep them, to transform them into 
intelligence report to profile what kind of behavioral patterns may appear and from that to decide immediately, even if the information is not completed, to act. So the more this group of people have information, the sooner they have them, the better for all of us. In that case, what is security? Security is not anymore about defense and war. It is, you have an additional layer, which is that security is about your future. Not what you have done, not what you are doing, but what you will do in the future. And that's why the discourse concerning prevention, protection, is so embedded now into the narratives that we have concerning security. So what is security? Well, it's a form of joint venture of information of time, capacity of surveillance and intelligence, preventive and protective actions. So security is more and more con connected with surveillance. People will accept happily to give information. Why? Because they enjoy the pleasure to be securized, to be protected by a group of professionals in charge of it. Who cannot love the protector in case of danger? Especially when this protection is done to save the democracy from these enemies. So, of course, this reasoning and its repetition ad nauseam. Through time by different government or private actors or international organization show only, in my view, two things. First, it is very difficult to learn lessons from the past. Second, it is easy to claim that a situation is radically new, that rules have to change to cope with the present and future situation and to be obeyed. But of course, and it's here that historians play a key role, historians show this repetitive pattern from the 13th century to the latest events of 2010. That even if the creativity of the discourse of unease and fear make each of this narrative very original, they repeat the same. So what is not new is the discourse about the radically new. And we can go on, of course, with sociologists like Craig Callan, but also a historian like the French historian Jean Delumeau, and of course the work of Charles Tilly to see how it has been encapsulated into a narrative about the radically new. So it is useful not to jump too quickly into the assertion that the contemporary situation is exceptional because of the possibility of nuclear terrorism, because of the existence of databases, because of the globalization of mobility, of markets, of networks of states, of technology, and so on. We have multiple narratives. Each of these narratives enter into competition about what is the main code. But they all go as if you have one key idea, the state sovereignty, the principle of monopoly of violence, is at stake. Even the most important states don't control for sure their territory. Uh, at least their pretense is really shaken by the possibility by clandestine organization to do massive form of violence into their own territory. 
So it could be explained through terrorist organization, it could be explained on the other way by globalization of capitalism and so on. But it is not the first time that contesting security argument or maybe surveillance argument for the sake of the population happens. And what I think is that we need at least to have a discussion about how to democratize the question of security. How is it possible to question the assessment of the professionals of security management and to see by non-professional if we share the way they organize the divide or the boundaries between what is security but what is not security, what is danger and even what is fate, because they put hierarchy. They will give that some events are, by definition, security issues, and others are not. And here you may have a lot of division concerning uh, political parties. Some will consider that terrorism is a key issue, an environment is not. Environment can be led by the market. And we have seen that. But terrorism is central. Others will say no, terrorism is in fact not so important. It kills people, but not much. And in comparison, we have the planet. Planet Earth is dying. So the security priorities will change depending of the struggle between who are these professionals of security, what kind of networks they are in. Uh, you may have people coming from defense, you may have people coming from border guards, you may have people coming from police. Many other groups will intervene, including not only bureaucrats from the states, but large corporate <coughs> bureaucracies. But they are also bureaucracies. And I think it's important for actors. So what do we have to ask if we want to democratize security? It's the assumptions about where are the boundaries? What kind of priority do we agree with the priorities which are given when people say they speak in our name. What kind of knowledge is at stake? What kind of know-how? What kind of practices? Including, of course, the discursive practices and the strategy of legitimization. And to put them in context, in terms of space and time, it is also very important to develop possibilities for the voices of the people who have been considered as undesirable, unwanted, and to see if they have been excluded through unanimity, majority, or through network of bureaucracies organizing the way they exclude or not people and what kind of people. It's very important, especially when we speak about discourse, not about what has been, not about detective story where you try to find what happened, but when you have a discourse which is a discourse concerning not what you have done, even not what you are doing now, but what you will do. Do we have in the capacity in terms of knowledge to know the future behavior of human beings? If you listen to the professional of security nowadays, in some ways they say, yes, we do. And that's 
One of the key questions maybe we need to discuss each time we have a discussion about security, surveillance and democracy. Is it true? Maybe you remember one of the novels of Philip K. Dick, The Minority Report, at least maybe the young generation, where in this novel, Philip K. Dick insists about the fact that in this world, you have three persons which have capacity to read the future. They are mutants. And so, in this world, you have no crime. Because they arrest everybody before the crime arrives. But at the same moment, the one who is organizing that says they have not yet committed the crime. So it's very difficult to say that they are punishable. We have them in indefinite detention. But we cannot assess what happened. I would say that, unfortunately, more and more, even if we don't have people who can read the future, the idea is that technology will do the same. That through a series of technologies, by different assessment, we will form a knowledge which is sufficiently coherent to give element to adjust the future, to tame the future, to transform the future into a past or a perfect future, a future perfect. In French, it works better because we say future antérieur. Sorry. <laughs> so what's going on there? What are the logic where a group of professionals large groups, in competition between themselves, consider that they can assess through probability, uncertainty, hazard, certain patterns which will fit nevertheless with certain group, and if they are really well organized, they will find one person, no, because, not because they know the person from the beginning, but because their system of profiling will reduce every category to only one number, you. But a you which is anonymous, a you which is not you as a person, but you as a number, you as a data table. And that's certainly one of the elements we have to discuss. So, if we have more surveillance, do we have more security? That's one of the questions. Because you can see how this technology of surveillance are now central in the definition of what means security and insecurity. How risk is coming as if it was a category which can mix up surveillance and security. And if we have more security, security for whom? Is it the safety of the individual? Is it the security of the state? Is it the security of a majority versus a minority? It's easy to speak about a right to security as long as you don't define who you are speaking about. But as soon as you are referring to different referent objects, individuals, and that's what the Constitution are doing. When you have a discourse about security, which is constitutionally protected, it's about the rights of individuals. 
not the rights of the state. But very often, the profession of politics, for many years, from right to the left, have tamed or blurred this distinction, saying that if you have a, a safety of the individual, the collectivity of the safety of the individual is the equivalent of the collective safety of the state. Maybe. But what about majority and minority? What about the fear of the majority to become minorities in their own countries? Is it not one of the key elements? Here, for example, the work of Arjun Apadurai is central to understand this fear of majorities to become minorities. So, security for some generate insecurity for others, and even more, generate insecurity for the ones which were considering themselves as part of the people which will be secure, that they can be transparent to the, the eye of the state because they have nothing to hide. But the discourse of the nothing to hide is very often a discourse where you People don't realize how easy it is possible to be profiled for many criteria that they consider as perfectly normal. So, if we have more surveillance, are we going to an Orwellian state? Well, the idea of the Orwellian state of 1984, of the Big Brother, Suppose that everybody is under surveillance. That everybody becomes the enemy of the state. Michel Foucault has used this terminology of the panoptical. It's pan which is important. Everybody suspects that the others are looking at. So you don't even need the surveillance because everybody believes that the surveillance exists somewhere. <clears throat> it's not really what we have. And that's my hypothesis. It's more a 10%. Many people are under rhizomatic surveillance. And we will come back to that. Many technologies. But it's very rare that, in fact, this surveillance is transformed into control into activities of coercion or surveillance with touching your body, blocking you, because that's more or less only the case for 10% of the population. And that's why the 90% are very happy with the situation. Security normalized. 90% of people. And people are happy to be normalized. They are in a different category than the others. Of course, it's all, and that's why the nothing to hide argument has quite a certain success, which is important in, in society. Because people don't consider that they are the first. They are not targeted. They can deliver their data and their personal data on Facebook without problem. They have nothing to hide. They don't realize how the technique of this form of self-exposure at a certain period of time may, 20 years after, in a different period, be used for intelligence recognition and patterns of profile.